Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucian. Some of you know me as Triangle Investor from X. My guest today is John Champelia, CEO of Sprott Asset Management. John is also a senior managing partner for Sprott Incorporated and a portfolio manager for the company's physical commodity funds. John, I'm very glad to have you in my show. A very warm welcome to you. Thanks very much. It's, uh, we're long overdue to, to speak, so I'm happy we were able to connect. Agreed. Uh, like I said, uh, you are a portfolio manager for the company's physical commodity funds that include a variety of commodities like uranium, precious metals, copper and more. Uh, but in today's show, I would like to cover only one, and that is my favorite commodity, uranium. Uh, John, I want to start, of course, with the current uranium market. In 2024, the market digested, again, a lot of positive news, potentially impacting the demand side. And on the other hand, more pressure on the supply side. I could ask you 10 questions about the status of the current uranium market, but I will try to sum it up in one wider question. And that is, at what stage is the uranium market now? And what do you expect for the remainder of 2024 for uranium market prices, news, etc.? Yeah, well, you know, it's coming up to three years. It'll be three years on July 19th that we launched the Sprout Physical Uranium Trust. And uh, to be totally candid with you, it's been a whirlwind and a bit of a blur. It's just there's been so, so much news flow and so many developments in the uranium sector that we had never, ever would have envisioned happening. And obviously, these are events that, um, you know, some of them are geopolitical, some of them are energy policy shifts. So it's been an enormous um, and obviously very profitable experience um, for our clients. So it's it's amazing. So where are we now? Um, I think, you know, to use a baseball analogy, which you're probably not too familiar with we're kind of entering kind of the, the beginning of the middle middle innings and a lot of people we talked to um in the last few months have said to us like you know this is this is such an, a, an interesting thesis and the the fundamentals are so compelling and you know why didn't you tell me about this two years ago and you know my response is well i probably did you just didn't take any action <laughs> yeah but Kidding aside, you know, we still think there is a lot of room for this bull market to develop. And, you know, we've been bullish on this commodity for a long time. Um, our thesis has played out um, very well. And but, you know, even at wherever we're at, we're at 8550 right now in the spot market, we still think there's a lot of room to grow. And I think you have to kind of zoom out and look at the big picture. It's really important. These commodity markets they tend to go on very long cycles, both up and down. And if you think about the down leg of this cycle, which was basically 2011 to 2020, that was a very painful uh, downturn that really um, took a lot of capacity out of the sector, resulted in little to no investment in the sector. And then you do a pivot, that obviously has been been driven by um, energy transition, energy security, a uh, whole bunch of very compelling reasons, and then all of a sudden you find a sector that is back on its on uh, on the on the front foot and is starting to enter a new cycle. These cycles don't last three or four years like they do a typical business cycle. Commodity cycles can last eight to ten years, and and as I just mentioned. The down leg of this cycle was almost 10 years. So we would not be surprised if the up cycle were to last eight to 10 years as well. And so where are we in this up, up cycle? Well, we're kind of entering the fourth year. And you know, if I think about where we were three years ago when we started the Uranium Trust, you know, the price of uranium was I think $28 a pound. And it was basically, you know, companies that were producing what, you know, some of the highest grade deposits in the world. Some of them were obviously realizing higher prices than $28 because they were delivering against contracts that were signed in the past at higher levels. So, you know, that was basically keeping them alive. You know, the price has almost tripled. Okay, that's great. And, and, and some people might very simply say, oh, I missed it. It's over. You know, darn, I wish I, I, I would have invested earlier. 
But if you know, I'm going to zoom out again and I and, and and give you the price point of uranium and in 2011. Why 2011? Because that was really the start of the bear market. The price in 2011 was around $70, 70, $72. And the price is 85, 86 right now in the spot market. So, you know, to us, that is pretty an interesting uh, set of data points. If you think about the cost structure of everything in the world in 2011 versus the cost structure of ever, everything in the world today, uh, I would hardly say we're at peak pricing. If you just simply inflation adjust that $72, just using US CPI, which is not the right parameter for mining inflation, um, you get about $100 a pound. And if you inflation adjust the last two cycles, uh, the last two bull markets in uranium uh, by US CPI, what you get is peak pricing of around $170 in today's dollar terms in the 1970s bull market. And you get about $200 a pound in the 2000s uh, um, uh, bull market. So at 85 bucks or so, we still think there is a lot more room to grow. Now, why do we think there's more room to grow? These are just, you know, these are arbitrary numbers, but we think there's more room to grow for a few simple reasons. One, the world needs more uranium. The amount of uranium that we will need to produce uh, between now and 2040, using, I would say, fairly conservative estimates, mean that the world will have to produce almost twice as much as we do today. And so you ask yourself, how do you go from a producing 150 million pounds a year to 300 million pounds a year when you basically haven't made any investment in the sector for 14 years? Exactly. Uh, there's only one way that happens. It's called higher incentive pricing for longer in order to raise the capital, build these very complicated mines in some cases, and to allow investors to make suitable rates of return on their investment, their capital. So this is um, a very classic you know, incentive price story at a time when the world is pivoting back to nuclear energy for a whole host of very interesting reasons. You know, a lot of people that we spoke to in the last couple of years, they were, they were really fixated on this cycle looking like the 2000 cycle and we kept saying to them no don't think of it like the 2000 cycle think of it as the 1970 cycle there are much more commonalities to that cycle that to to the current one is is our is our opinion so what happened in the 1970 cycle you had an oil uh, oil shock energy crisis which opec basically uh instigated which then created a massive shift uh, towards nuclear energy. This is when most of the power stations in you know United States, Canada, where I live, France, exact, you know, et cetera, were all built. And this was really a mitigation strategy, a mitigation strategy so that they were not beholden to OPEC again. If you think about what's happened in the last two years, very similar situation. You had a massive energy shock, not one commodity, almost every commodity shock. Why? because Russia is a huge producer of many commodities. And that was a real eye opener for a lot of governments in the West, who I think very foolishly were, were marching down the path of decommissioning perfectly good, perfectly good and safe nuclear power stations in the quest to decarbonize, to decarbonize and then focus on renewables. That didn't work out so well. I think Germany is a really great case study there. And so you've got this big shift of demand um, now, demand is going to be three or four percent, but that's incredible, you know, relative to basically zero growth that we had for many years. So you've got basically a, a very different story unfold. When we got involved in uranium, it was one dimensional. It was supply, supply, supply. We basically had a structural supply deficit. Uh, we Our basic thesis was the only way you fix a, a structural supply deficit is through higher pricing. Now you've got the same structural supply deficit coupled with a growing demand picture because countries are keeping what they have on for longer. Countries are restarting power plants that have been closed. Countries are investigating the build out of new capacity. And obviously everyone is very interested in, in, in figuring out how to deploy more uh, smaller reactors, which I think have greater versatility have lower risk in terms of costs and deployment. 
And so when you squish it all together, it's it's easy to say, okay, I understand why the price of uranium has tripled. I understand why the price of conversion and rich uranium have quadrupled. Yeah. Um, and we haven't even talked really too much about Russia. So it's a very interesting commodity. And last year I thought, you know, we had a real breakout year. The price of uranium, you know, went up 89%. And a lot of other commodities struggled last year. Obviously, a lot of industrial metals struggled battery metal struggle, but uranium was kind of the bright light that really broke out because of the, these very unique and compelling fundamentals. So where are we now? We had a big breakout last summer from you know mid, the mid fifties. We hit $91 at the end of 2023, which you know uh, caught us a little bit, bit off guard in terms of the momentum. Uh, we peaked out at about $106. We had a couple of of tests um, and we've, we've kind of hit 83, 84 twice and we've, we've bounced off those levels each time. I, I think the market is clearly consolidating the gains of last year. We do not think $86 is a strong enough price to incentivize any greenfield production. We think $86 is a really good price for an existing producer. And for all of the mines that have been on care and maintenance for the last 10 to 15 years, they're all coming back online. That's wonderful. Um, but in terms of, is that a sufficient price to build new new mines? Probably not in most parts of the world. And I think that's obviously reflecting in why the term pricing going out is reflecting $100, $120, $130. I think that's obviously where the market wants to get to in due course. Now, yeah. where are we right now? You know, we're, we're in a little bit of a news gap. You know, everyone is kind of waiting for more signs um, of what production is going to look like. Um, and the most meaningful piece of news everyone seems to be uh, focused on is what are the Kazakhs going to tell us in August about 2025? Yeah. Our thought is it's going to be nominal at best in terms of uh, potential uh, production. Uh, yeah, great point on the cycles and uh, on incentive price as well. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people, investors, even some experts, throwing numbers for the current uranium incentive price and saying we are well over that price. But just like you, I would argue that when I look at the costs, challenges, interest rates and other important factors, I believe that we are seeing north of 90 even $100 that incentive price. Would you agree with me? Yeah, so this has been a debate for the last few years. You know, everyone was like, well, when we get to 60, are all these mines going to get built? No. Are we get to 70? Are they going to get built? No. So I think it's fair to say that just about every mine that has any, any you know, economically viable deposit um, remaining is currently, its cost curve is cur is below the, the term price. So and, and, and why we believe that is because when you hear about mines that haven't operated for five, six, seven, eight, even 15 years that are now able to turn back online, that tells you that the whole industry's cost curve is essentially below where we are right now in terms of current market pricing. Now, you raise a really good point. The cost to build a new mine is very different than a mine that has a lot of sunk capex from years ago. And depending on the region, depending on the, the complexity and the time of permitting, um, you're going to get variation. Obviously, some places in Africa, time to bring a new mine to market and labor costs, et cetera, are lower than Canada, which has in, you know incredibly high um, environmental permitting standards, et cetera, et cetera. So there isn't one universal answer. I think it's case by case, depending on jurisdiction, type of mine, grade of deposit, size of deposit, et cetera. So, but, you know, our belief is that uh, over the next four to five years, we do not see where a meaningful supply response is coming from. And that's why we remain very bullish on the price. That's why we think we're still in the middle innings of this bull market. So if you look around the world and say, okay, where is the meaningful supply going to come from? Um, is it going to come from Canada? Well, it's starting to come from Canada, you know, Two, three years ago, production was probably about 20 million pounds uh, lower than where we are. So it's starting to come from Canada. It's starting to come in from pockets of, of Australia and Africa and, and more recently the U.S. 
Um, but until you start to build meaningful new projects, uh, we would argue the next gen project uh, being one of the highest potential in the world. Until the Kazakhs figure out what their their you know supply chain of sulfuric acid looks like, we don't know where you're going to get the next twenty million pounds from. Yes, you're going to start to get ones and twos and threes per you know million pounds per year come online. But in terms of where are the tens and fifteens and twenties coming from, we don't see that coming for for potentially four to five years. And why that's so important, it will fuel the longevity of the bull market. Yeah. Uh, John, would you agree that a lot of money is sitting on the sidelines with U.S. money market funds having big balances waiting to find the new home for them? And one of them could be uranium, right? Yeah, I mean, there's record amounts. Uh, I think it's $6 trillion right now sitting in money market funds. Some of that money, I think is probably destined to stay there. Um, but other money, I think, will definitely come back in the market. What we've talked about uh, about commodity investing is, is, is the following. The amount of exposure that institutional investors have to commodities is little to none. And I can tell you, I've talked to hundreds of institutions over the last four or five years. And when you talk about their commodity exposure, it's shocking to us how little exposure they have. Now, in their defense, up until three years ago, there was little to no reason to be invested in commodities. The prices were were, were uneconomic. Uh, there was very little interest. There was no energy security shift. There was very little kind of decarbonization going on. There was no Inflation Reduction Act. There was no you know Green Deal in Europe. So there was, wasn't a compelling reason. Now, the last three years, we would say there's been massive inflection points with a lot of these markets. And what these investors are trying to figure out now is after not being exposed to many of these sectors for 10 or 12 years, how do I go about doing it? So that's you know why we generally um, have conversations with them. They want to understand what is going on in some of these markets. What are the best ways to, to get exposure to these commodities? So that's what we do. We do a lot of you know market overview and commentary, you know, sharing how other institutions go about. And so you don't need a ton. You don't need a tsunami of money to come back in the sector. You just need a little bit of money from the other buckets, whether it's technology stocks or, you know, money market. You just need a little bit of that money to go, you know, from bucket one to bucket two. And all of a sudden it starts to make a meaningful impact. And what we've seen the last three or four years is investor interest in metals seems to be focused on things related to energy transition, energy metals, as we like to call them. Um, interest in precious metals, I would say, has been further behind, but improving of late. But the lion's share of the interest uh, and, the, and the institutions we've engaged with over the last few years have been very focused on things related to energy uh, because they see the energy landscape has shifted and they see that the energy landscape is going to move um, from liquids and gases, oil and gas, to more solids. And solids are very, you know, are obviously metals, um, given all the different technologies that are very metal intensive. And that's what, you know, I think the current trend is, we're still early. Are all the institutions investing? No, not a chance. But you only need a small number of these guys to start making decisions and it starts to snowball. And as these sectors recapitalize, as they become larger, as they become more liquid, you end up having a, a greater universe of institutional investors that can participate in some of these segments. Good point. Uh, John, can you give us an update on uh, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust? Uh, what's going on behind closed doors with Spot and uh, discussions with institutional investors? Can you give me some color on that? Yeah, I would say the 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 most interesting thing with with spot is that the the types of investors that are engaging with us now have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early days, it was very small, nimble hedge funds and family offices that saw the thesis and acted on it, and you know that they were well rewarded for that. In the last, I would say, ten months, we've seen a real shift of interest to larger institutions, more generalists. And as I said, are they all investing? No, 
but many of them are starting to get positioned and that's great. Um, these are funds that I think we're waiting for the fund to get bigger. They're also waiting for more market signals. And I think since last September, the market signals have been coming at them very consistently. And that's given them the confidence to say, okay, these signals are confirming our thesis. Uh, we've got a long-term view on this commodity and we're going to start positioning at 80 and 90 or hundred dollars or whatever price point they got into. So yes, they, they weren't there at 40 and 50, but they've been there at 60, 70, 80, 90, and I would even argue hundred dollars. So that's, what's really been happening. We've purchased, I think, about two and a quarter million pounds of uranium so far. So we've been chipping away. The fund, you know, has been trading better. Uh, we hit a couple of air pockets for sure when we had those little corrections. But what we find is that when the fund has a bit of a correction, those institutions that kind of missed the first move uh, are more keen to kind of build positions when the fund's trading at a discount to NAP. And that's great because they're going to support the fund. And historically, if you look at the trading history of the trust, when it does widen out to a double digit percent increase, if you invest at those points, the subsequent two and three month returns historically have looked really good. So those are good you know, entry points for people. Um, right now, we're trading at a discount, so we haven't been you know, issuing new units and buying more material, but we've had a pretty good start to the year. As I said, we're in this kind of summer doldrums, lack of news flow, but I would expect, you know, September on, maybe even August, I'm going to say August because I think the Kazakh news is going to be bullish. Um, but I think August on, we're going to go for another run is, is it would be my guess. Yeah, you mentioned new inventory, and I believe there is not a better person to ask this question. How are we looking with commercial in inventory supply? So the thing about the uranium market is you have to bifurcate it into two markets. The term market, which is what utilities use to uh, acquire the vast majority of their uranium through long-term contracts, um, and then the spot market. So the trust only buys in the spot market. And where does that material come from? It comes from countries that have offtake agreements with certain traders. Yeah. Those traders take delivery of the pounds and they need to find a home. We try to buy those pounds whenever we can. The utilities, I would say, have historically nibbled in the, in the spot market. They will come, they will buy 15 to 20% of maybe their needs. Now, what we've seen over the last six months is utilities have kind of stepped away from the spot market. And I think that was a very, uh, you know, concerted effort to not push the price up, not to chase it, because the price, as you remember, late last year and into January was really moving quickly. So they, you know, kind of stepped away from the spot market and shifted their attention back to the term market. You know, that's fine. Um, and, and so that, I think, has, has created, a, at times, fewer buyers in the spot market, which, which is why I think the price has become a bit more volatile. If you think about producers, um, our, our guess is they've also stepped away from the spot market. They were there last year at times, but they've been less active this year. And it's I think it's it's a pretty simple reason. You know, if you're a producer and you're delivering uranium that you sold under a contract in the past, and let's say the price you realize is $58. Well, what incentive do you have to come to the spot market, buy at 85 and deliver at 58? That doesn't make any sense at all. So they've stepped away from the spot market. And what are they doing? Well, they're drawing down their inventories. And it's very clear. The inventories are coming down quickly. Um, I'm sure they're asking customers, hey, can we delay delivery? Uh, is it okay if we 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 you know we uh, we push out your delivery window if you don't need it today? I'm sure they're doing everything in their power not to be able you know not to force themselves into into the spot market. So there's definitely been a few dynamics in the spot market, but the truth is some utilities are well covered for the next few years because they've been proactive and they've seen they they listened to the market signals. Other utilities didn't believe the market signals and have been less active buying uranium. Yeah. And I think, and, and our belief is they're less well covered. Now, take a step back. The reality is utilities over the next 20 odd years probably need to build uh, to buy over 2 billion pounds of uranium. So the future demand for uranium looks great. 
And the reality is there's no other option. You're not closing down your power station. You are going to plug your nose and you're going to pay up. Um, you know, when the price hit $106 and we, we did a call to some institutional investors, one investor on the call said to me, oh my gosh, you know, we're at $106. Are we going to see demand destruction set in? And I was like, huh, what? Demand destruction? Um, obviously, you don't understand much about the nuclear um, sector. There's no demand destruction at $106, $150, $200, $250. You are going to pay if you need the fuel, full stop. <laughs> and utilities will kick and scream and, and hate it. But if they need to buy more uranium, they're going to pay up. And I think that's why the price has tripled. And obviously, the prices of the services, remember, these aren't products, the services related to conversion and enrichment have quadrupled over the same period because obviously Russia has a disproportionate involvement in those two uh, parts of the fuel chain. So, you know, we think the price is, is going to stay higher for longer and that's exactly what the industry needs. Otherwise it will not build the upstream uh, capacity that it needs to match the downstream aspirations. Spot on John. Uh, John, how do you see uranium equities performance going forward? Are the uranium equities in disconnect versus spot price? Yeah, this is a really interesting topic. So I think it's fair to say that we went through a period from around November 2021 to July of 2023, where the equities got ahead of themselves, and then they lagged the commodity price for a long time, which really frustrated people. Because again, what's the whole point of investing in equities? It's to capture operating leverage as the commodity price goes up. It's to capture optionality with new discoveries and, and you know moving projects from, from pre-feasibility to feasibility to construction and obviously production. So investors are looking for that, that you know, upside potential of the equities, and they weren't getting it over that period of time. And I, you know, and it's and it's really a point in time test because the equities got ahead of themselves as the price of uranium broke out from 30 and hit $50. And the situation has clearly started to reverse. It's reversed in two ways. One, since last August, the equities um, are performing better. And it's not just one stock in the group. It's obviously there's winners and losers across the whole group, irrespective of a bull market. But the equities as a group are performing better. That's thing one. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that risk appetite is improving. It also tells us that the stocks maybe got too cheap relative to the commodity price. The second signal we look at is flows. When you look at the flows going into uranium mining ETFs, which we watch globally, relative to the dollars going into physical uranium commodity funds, last year in 2023, the ratio was about six for every $10 of new money going into the sector, about $6 went in the uranium mining ETFs, $4 went into the physical commodity fund. So we started to see a, a rotation in terms of performance, rotation of flows. And for 2024 so far, I think that number is closer to $8 for every 10 has gone in uranium mining ETFs versus the physical. So. This year, you're seeing more dollars going into the equities. You're also seeing better performance out of the equities year to date. Obviously, we've had a bit of a correction here, but the equities have performed better relative to the commodity, which year to date is down about about uh, we're down about five dollars a pound, and the equities are up you know five to ten percent, let's say. So I think that tells us that the 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 ratio is improving, risk appetite is improving relative valuation has improved. Um, and it's generally, I think, a healthier sign that money's coming back into the riskier parts of, of the market. Yeah. John, I would like to talk more of and educate our uranium investors with uranium-related ETFs. Uh, can you provide a brief overview of the uranium mining ETF and the junior uranium mining ETF and their investment strategies? Yeah, sure. So ETFs have proven to be very popular choices amongst not just retail investors, but also institutional investors. 
And it's for a few reasons. One, they're, they're, they're very simple, uh, low cost, uh, liquid and transparent vehicles. And for a lot of investors, and I don't care, it doesn't matter if you're a do-it-yourself investor or a very sophisticated institution, you've got a positive uh, outlook on the commodity or the sector. You then ask yourself, how do I want to express my view? Do I want to figure out which companies to buy you know, out of that investment universe? Do I have the technical skills? Do I want to you know, make the time and investment to follow all these companies? Or do I just want to simply buy the basket? And this is why ETFs have been very popular, particular among thematic and sectors. Investors just take the whole basket. So we have two different indexes that we offer through ETFs in both the United States and across Europe. The, the ones in Europe are USIS eligible. The ones in the US are essentially 40 act funds. The indexes are basically the same. We have one uh, index, which is the, the, the larger of the two, which is the Sprott Uranium Mining ETF. Um, it just simply buys the biggest producers it has an allocation to the physical commodity itself through a couple of vehicles. And then it has the smaller producers, the next generation producers, and then a bunch of exploration companies. So you get kind of a, a wide cross section of companies across different geographies at different stages of development. And then you get the, you get the physical allocation, which is around 18%. Um, the junior fund is a very simple uh, um, uh, version, which is you take the two largest producers out, which are Cameco and Kazatomprom. You take the physical proxies out, which obviously the Sprott Fiscal Uranium Trust is the largest. And, and then you get everything else, which is the small producers and down. And even though, even though you just simply took four holdings out of the junior fund, you end up with an index that's 50% different. Mm -hmm. So it's very different, um, even though there's only four different, you know, four holdings that are different. The constitution is very different. It's smaller cap. It's less liquid. It has more exposure to uh, smaller cap stocks, micro, some micro cap stocks. And obviously it has a lot more volatility. So it really depends on, you know, how bullish you are, how much volatility you're comfortable with. Uh, we really don't care how investors express their view. We've got our flagship uranium trust. We've got the the you know the kind of all cap uranium miners. We got the the junior uranium miners, and what we often find is investors will hold rate some ratio of one, two, or even three of them. Um, sometimes those ratios are just based on bullish bullishness. Sometimes that ratio is based on relative value. So, for example, when the commodity price was outperforming the equities. People were overweighting the commodities and underweighting the equities. I would say in the last 10 months or so, we've seen, as I mentioned with the flows, we've seen more overweighting of equities and, and, and less exposure to the commodity. So it really depends on how people want to trade, yeah. uh, what their risk appetite and liquidity parameters are. Uh, as I said, we're agnostic. We just want to have a complete suite of solutions. You know, Sprott, I think, is the largest investor in uranium in the world. Uh, we've got um, you know about eight billion or, or so dollars um, across the suite of funds, and uh, you know we want to we want to maintain that leadership position. It's very important to us. Yeah, uh, what geographical regions are most uh, represented in the uran uranium mining ETF and the junior mining uh, ETF? Do you know? Yeah, so I would say that in the in the uranium miners ETF, you really have to think about the big producers because they're they're so important in the index. So that would obviously be uh, Satin Prom uh, and Cameco, um, which would be, you know, Kazakhstan and Canada. And then you've got a bunch of other smaller um, producers that are in places like Africa and Australia. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of emerging producers that uh, people are very hopeful are going to come to market in the next few years in Canada, given the Athabasca Basin is is essentially like the Saudi Arabia of uranium. It is it is one of the richest deposits uh, and ore grades of uranium in the world. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating place to go and see. It is very remote. It's in the absolute middle of nowhere. And I'm absolutely astonished after going there a couple summers ago 
um, how challenging it must be to find, you know, the needle in the haystack amongst, you know, this very barren uh, land that's just full of trees and lakes, how they found these uranium deposits, and then more importantly, how they're actually able to build these mines in remote locations and deal with some very, you know, um, very real challenges related to um, engineering and water management and all these kinds of things. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, agreed. Uh, John, how have the uranium mining ETFs and junior uranium mining ETF performed over the past few years? Yeah, I, I don't have the exact stats in front of me, but the uranium miners ETF or since its inception in the United States is, is has to be in the top decile of, of performance of, across the entire ETF landscape of non-levered ETFs. Um, we run these we run these screens every once in a while, and uh, it has been an incredible producer of returns. And that was obviously uh, starting off at a time when nobody cared; everything was kind of bombed out. And so, obviously, the starting point was you know very early in the cycle, and that's why the gains have been strong. Now it's been volatile, and we always tell people you, you know you shouldn't invest in the sector if the volatility is going to wash you out i remember last july we talked to some investors and they said you know we're kind of questioning our investment you know we think we're missing something here um it's just not panning out the market's kind of in a range and we're moving on and you know i, I feel so bad now in hindsight because literally a month later the market took off and so you have to be careful you don't get washed out when we hit these periods of volatility you know, try to dollar cost average when we hit these pockets. Um, and what's amazing to us is that even though uh, the sector has performed as well as it has over the last three years, you would think naturally, well, how big is the fund? Is it $10 billion? Is it $15 billion? No, it's not even $2 billion. So, you know, when people say, is the, is the, is have the returns basically made the trade crowded not a chance you know this fund given its returns should be multiples bigger but it's it's not because investors still haven't figured out the thesis or they just have you know there's stigma around it there's legacy around it uh just a lot of funds can't you know get involved because of their mandates i'm i'm always amazed that this sector sh shouldn't shouldn't uh it should have attracted, I should say, much higher levels of capital, given the rates of return that have been available. And maybe it's simply, a, you know, NVIDIA technology phenomena where people are just chasing technology stocks, which obviously is a much, much bigger and more liquid sector. And that's the way, uh, you know, they're getting exposure to, to, to a different theme. But, you know, if anybody's interested in the energy sector, it doesn't matter if it's oil and gas or not it's something you need to think about yeah definitely uh, i have a few more questions about etf uh, what trends in the uranium market are currently impacting the uranium mi mining etf and the junior of course yeah i would say what's really ha helping is higher commodity prices higher commodity prices are really the lifeblood for these companies if the commodity price is not uh attractive you are not going to get production. You are not going to get these projects moving. You're not going to be able to raise the necessary capital to build the mines of tomorrow. And so the commodity price, you know, many of these companies will live and die on. Now, if you don't have a great deposit and or you're in a jurisdiction that are, is going to be challenging, well, it doesn't matter if the commodity price is $1,000. You're going to be impacted by those local issues. And we've seen some, some of the mining companies get hit by some of that, those things in the last 12 months. But if you're operating in a in a in a good mining jurisdiction, uh, these prices are really attractive. And you know, I'll go back to my comment I made earlier about mines that have not operated for five, six, eight, 10, 15 years, being able to come back online, going from a dormant asset to a cash flow producing asset again, that is so important. So the commodity price has really lifted these mining stocks. And I think that's why these mining stocks have finally started to perform better, um, not just as a group, but, 
you know, um, the breadth, the breadth of the of the performance has improved uh, quite a bit in the last year as well. So that's really important. And um, you know, if it, and again, if commodity prices stay higher for longer, the the equities I think are are very well positioned to capitalize on that. Yeah, uh, John, I am based in Europe. Um, do you know on which European exchanges are the UC, uh, UC ETS versions of the uranium mining ETF and junior uranium mining ETF listed? Do you know yeah. on what stock exchanges? Yeah, so we have a partnership with Han ETF. They're basically a white label ETF provider. We've been working with them for the last few years. Um, they do a great job in terms of um, launching products for us to allow European investors to get access to them. So right now, the two uranium mine ETFs are listed in, in uh, London, Germany, and in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, I believe one of them may also be in Switzerland. Um, so they're they're available in a, uh, across a number of exchanges in a number of different currencies. Uh, we also have um, the two funds listed in the United States, but for European investors, you know, buying in euros or, or sterling or whatever is obviously the preferred um, uh, choice. And, um, you know, have a look at their website, Han ETF. You'll see the two Sprott mining uh, ETFs there. And, um, you know, they've been growing nicely. Um, we'd like them to continue growing. We think European investors um, are a little bit behind in terms of, of some of the other markets we've been dealing with. And and obviously those funds are, are newer. So, you know, we're still trying to scale those right now, but we find the European investors historically have had a little bit more apprehension about investing in, in nuclear energy and uranium. I would tell you that, that that is starting to fade. More and more institutions I talk to there seem to be over it. Um, it's not universal. We still find some pockets where, believe it or not, uranium and nuclear energy are on exclusion lists, which we think is completely uh, antiquated. And that as I think the stigma fades away, more uh, European investors will, will have a look at the sector and, and get involved. Okay, from your corner, what was the rationale behind launching uh, UC ETS uh, versions of uh, uranium mining ETF and the junior mining ETF in Europe? What was the rationale? Yeah, so a lot of investors, you know, they just simply can't access uh, ETFs across the pond to North America. Um, we find that in almost every market, there's a very high home country bias, meaning people prefer to buy locally registered products in their local currency. And, and so launching the USITS versions is really allowing us to package the products in the most uh, convenient and favorable you know, options that European investors prefer. And it's worked out well. We've had really good support um, in those funds. And um, you know, if we find that there are products that we have in North America, that we think are relevant to, to Europe, that's something we'll consider in the future. Can we wrap it as a USITS uh, fund and distribute it through, uh, throughout the region? Uh, how was actually the initial reception and investor interest in these ETFs since their launch? And it's been excellent. I mean, uh, we have people constantly emailing us and, and messaging us on Twitter that, hey, we want this fund in Europe, please bring it to us. So uh, we love that kind of engagement from, from investors. Uh, we do listen to them, and uh, I'm very happy that we that we followed the uranium miners ETF with the junior. Uh, again, it's the only junior uh, uranium mining ETF that's available in Europe, uh, and that's important when you can provide a, a very differentiated, um, you know, first of its kind product to investors. And you know, I think investors, if you're bullish, you know that that junior uranium mining ETF is is. Uh, is something that is, is going to appeal to someone. Yeah, uh, that was my guest, John Champalia. John, thank you for coming to my show. It was a great chat as I expected, and I hope uh, to bring you on for another update soon. Thank you very much, sir. That was great talking to you, and uh, keep up the good work. Um, you do a really great service of helping educate investors and bringing on different uh, guests. So uh, continue continue your efforts there.